All right, let's open the Bibles again to Psalm chapter 115. All right, all right, praise God. Psalm chapter 115. <clears throat> You know what I do if what I do if I wasn't saved? I'd get saved. Oh, this is the best time I think ever that should be saved, because there's some good things about to happen in the church. All right. I'm gonna read here and we will start. Praise God. I'm starting to read here from um Psalm chapter 115 and verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens of the Lord's, for the earth has he given to the children of men. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Now yesterday, we, or day before yesterday, we came some distance with this. Let's kind of go back and look at a couple of things. One, you and I are born again. If you're not born again, you can get born again today, tonight, anytime. And uh, this means that you and I have really come from another place. We have, the Bible says over in J uh, John chapter 3, verse 3, we were born from above. Now, this above, <clears throat> sometimes you say, you know, somebody said, you know, where is heaven? And they point up. And then you ask somebody down the other side of the earth, where is heaven? And they point up. <clears throat> so now heaven is up both places. But let me go deeper into it in terms of heaven. Heaven is another dimension. It's dimensional. And um, when you and I leave this uh, body and when, when our time is over in this earth, we just step out of this body into another dimension. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And uh, we, you and I, are to operate in this earth based on where we've come from, not based on where we are now. Now that might sound simplistic, but that is profound. And you have to do that because people ask you questions, I mean, and you have to answer them based on where you come from. And um, <clears throat> also, uh, as we come in this earth, uh, where God sends us, Brother Copeland says, not employed, but deployed, then we are to rule in that area. Um, you and I, uh, have been given the kingdom of God. The Bible says over in Luke chapter 17, verse, verse 20, 21, the kingdom of God is within you. So wherever you go, you take the kingdom and the king. Amen. So you're going in those places. Why? Because what you're going to do is bring them under kingdom culture. You're going to bring them under kingdom culture. You're going to bring them under the submission of the kingdom. The kingdom of God, the Bible says, in Psalm 103 and verse 19, the kingdom of God ruleth over all. His kingdom rules over all. Now, danger has increased in the earth. Like he said, we're living in the most dangerous times of all. But it's because of the curse in what's going on. And without the kingdom, really, and kingdom being taught or the kingdom being deployed, then the world would not it, it'd self destruct, it would not last. So the Bible calls us salt and light. Are you with me on that? Yes, sir. And so as we go places, we light the way, not only there, but we preserve uh, the conditions that are uh, in the earth. And we are to make things better. Now Jesus came, as Brother Copeland ended up there, he's really led right into what some of the things I'm going to talk about, is he came in Mark chapter 1, Verse 14, let's go over there, please. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, I've been preaching the kingdom of God for years to the point that years ago I wrote a book on it, The Kingdom of God Within You, and um, <clears throat> just been teaching on it a long time because that was part of my assignment. That's what he gave me to do. 
He says, verse 14, now that now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the Bible. Uh, pardon me, believe the gospel. And he says here, uh, repent, means to re is a prefix, means to return. So go back to an original state where we're talking about here is he said jubilee. And when I'm talking about this teaching that I'm doing now on taking ownership, it's about a jubilee. It's about Jesus coming into the earth, bringing this earth back into the hands of its rightful ownership. Hallelujah. Bringing the earth back into the hands of its rightful ownership. We're not stealing anything or anything like that. We're repossessing something. It's something that belongs to God and his people. Now, as we look at that, let's go over to Isaiah chapter 9, because this is a place where um, uh, it was prophetically spoken of by Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. And we'll start reading here at verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, underline that, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, one of the first things you're saying, the increase of his government, there shall be no end. So the kingdom is going to expand and there will be no end. And I think Brother Creflo preached it this morning. These things will be done. Uh, without hands. In other words, um, we we'll have to rely on God's ability to make this happen. Now that's new for people who've come out of the world because, you know, that's what we've always said. You know, if I don't look out for me, who's going to look out for me? You know, and, and it's been about self and some of the teaching sometimes it gets about, about self, self in the center. But really, Christ is in the center. Jesus, the God, is in the center. And so he's saying here, that uh, this government, so it's a new government that's coming. Now, that's where we have to get our minds adjusted. That's part of the repentance, that we have to get our minds adjusted, because I'm going to talk about some things today, and I don't want people to get the wrong idea of it. But we are not designed sovereign, okay? We are designed to have an overlord. And so that's where the enemy tricks people because um, he sometimes raises up people um, who um, are open to uh, his deceptive ways and they think they're in charge, but they're really not. He's in charge of them and, and so forth. But we have to understand that um, here's Jesus. He's the head of the church. Say head of the church. He's the head of the church. Okay. Now, we're here, his body, to carry out uh, his plans here in this earth. So he says, he goes on down and says, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. It's kind of interesting about this, and I'm going to get into it, I hope I have time, that the, <clears throat> that the justice system of the earth in the final days is going to be one of the key targets of demonic abuse, the justice system. And the, because judgment and justice is vital to the manifestation of the kingdom. Amen. All right. 
Just write it, praise God, you'll get it. Now, as we look at this, we talked about ownership. So we went back and looked at the life of Adam. So we saw that God said to Adam, Genesis 1, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So then, after he created Adam and gave him dominion, we said, let's look and see what the word dominion means. <clears throat> and what we said is there's a definition that came out of the Webster 1828 Dictionary says a sovereign of supreme authority, a power to govern or control, the power to direct, control, use, or dispose of at pleasure, dominion. And then we went through some words. We said dominion means rulership, lordship, caretakership or stewardship. And also we said it means ownership. Now you can see all of all of those in the scriptures, when you say rulership, you mean um, his kingdom rules over all. When you say lordship, you mean um, I give you uh, power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall be any means hurt you. We know that a power, that first power there is authority. So this lordship, caretakership, you see that we call it stewardship. Where in Matthew 25, where he said, you've been faithful over a few things, and I'm going to make you ruler over many things. So notice, because of the faithfulness on one level, God elevates you, God promotes you to another level. Stewardship. That's taking care of someone, someone else's goods. And then we said ownership. And what Brother Copeland said when he came out here <clears throat> in and preach with me standing beside him, praise God. Um, he said this, now this is powerful. We are not stewards. We are owners with stewardship responsibilities. Now I'm gonna tell you something folks. <clears throat> that is not preached. That is not preached. And the problem with that is that the body can't go any further than what's preached. Can't go any further than what's preached. He said, I think it's over here in Romans chapter 10. Let me just take my time now so you just bear with me. Chapter 10 and verse 13, for whosoever <clears throat> shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him who they've not believed? And how can they believe on him who they've not what? Heard. And how can they hear without a who? Preacher. And how can he preach? They preach except they be sent. Notice, 12 were sent. They came back and 10 of them preached something that caused 3 million to stay in the wilderness. Is this the right group I'm talking to? I'm just saying Jesus said over in Matthew's gospel, I'm just flipping some scriptures now because I'm warming up, praise God. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, he said in verse 14, let them alone, they be blind, leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both of them are going to fall into the ditch. Now notice, can't go any further than what you've heard. And, I, and we haven't heard that. Not as a mass. Because once you have ownership mentality, yes, sir. you treat it different. You treat it different because you own it. Own it. You, you, you start acting with a little bit more authority. Huh. 
Hey, wait, wait, what you doing going in my car? <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? You don't stand back and say, oh boy, he, he breaking in that car. No, that's my car. You sitting up here, I heard Brother Copeland give an example one, one year, years back. He said, if you're sitting down and your coat is on the front here, and let's say it's a very expensive coat, and you said, uh, watch my coat, I'm going to the restroom, be right back. And then while they're gone, somebody comes by and takes the coat, you know, and you come back and say, where's my coat? He says, well, somebody came by here and, and took it. Where, where'd they go? You know, and notice the, the folk who sat there were concerned but not excited. <laughs> now, I want you to get this because this whole idea of ownership. I gave you an example where a lady, when we were starting the ministry in Chicago and how we uh, were there in, in, uh, in this little storefront church, the lady broke in the door and in a panic. Where is the pastor? I said, I'm the pastor. <laughs> I need your help. I said, what do you need, lady? Uh, those drug dealers are taking over my block. Now, I told you about this yesterday, but get this. I said, lady, <clears throat> get in this circle. Let's pray. Because prayer is key in the kingdom. So once we prayed, I downloaded, because in the kingdom, you don't learn, you discern. When I throw stuff out there, most of it can't be taught, it's got to be caught. You, you know, sometimes people are using the head so much, I play tennis a lot, and that's what he told me, he said, hey, you know, Bill, you're using your head too much. So this, you got to shift it down to your heart. You got to, that, that's certain things that's got to come out of there. You just know what to do. Yeah. And, and I'm saying that I just knew what to do. Nobody had taught me that. I'd never been that way before. I've never been in a situation before, but I knew what to do. Yeah. And that's why he calls in Matthew 13. He said, it's given to you know, to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Mysteries are, is, is, is knowledge beyond human comprehension. Amen. So it's given to you to have knowledge beyond any of the greatest unsaved PhDs that are out there. Amen. Amen. Nothing wrong with the education, but I'm, I'm saying this, that this, we can get information on another level. Hey, okay, now just listen to me. So I downloaded. So I gave her that. And when I said that, I said, God said, take this jar, bottle of oil and go and pour it. And pour it down the center of your block, the street. Now she just took it. I didn't say, if you do that, all of a sudden, this is going to happen. So she just took it. And I'm telling you, we're trying to figure out too much. If we just take some stuff, just like God said it. And so what she do, she poured it down there. And she came back, all excited. Said, Pastor, guess what? Well, I knew what, because the word won't return void. All we got to do is whatever he says, come on, do it. This is, this is kingdom I'm talking about now. See, because to, to toil is under the curse. I'm redeemed. I don't have to toil physically or mentally. I don't have to toil. So what happened? She took ownership over her community. And what I'm saying is, when there's no ownership, there is no outrage. When, when, when Rosa Parks, how many of y'all ever heard of a lady named Rosa Parks? 
Okay. She was in the first part of the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama years ago. They desegregated the, the communities and so forth. But she's working in this law office and begin to see her rights. And then she gets on the bus. She said, I'm not sitting in the back anymore. I'm sitting up front. And sat there. And once she sat there, the bus driver said, you got to move it to the back. She said, nope. He said, listen, lady, don't cause me any problem. Just get on in the back. Nope. Why? Because revelation will bring a revolution. In other words, you will no longer put up with the enemy doing what he's doing. No ownership, no outrage. So when the Supreme Court comes down and says, take the Bibles out of the schools, the church would say, oh, isn't that too bad? Too bad. We rule over it. We're the ones. You're not waiting on God. God is not running the world. God is running the church. The church is running the world. Folks, don't think for a minute that the enemy can come up and make laws that you have to sit there and take. Wherever you go, cultures, environments, Legislation, codes, ordinances, regulations, policies, rules must adjust themselves to accommodate your occupation. Oh yeah, I, 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 I experienced this. He told me, they said, now let us say, uh, we were going to buy a shopping mall. Uh, uh, Pastor Winston, uh, we're sorry. The uh, city council has voted. And they have uh, uh, changed the zoning and an ordinance that you cannot have a church on that same shopping mall complex. Okay. Now, I asked one of my board members, I said, now, we supposed to have service in there tomorrow night. And they voted that we can't. I said, no, to that person, I said, what do you think we should do? <laughs> Pastor, I don't know anything to do but sue them. <laughs> I, I said, well, how long is that going to take? Oh, could take five or six years. Five or six years? I said, I got to be in there tomorrow night, man. Yeah. 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 Are you with me? Yeah. Then I ask another one. What, what, what do you think we should do? Well, there's another vacant place way up north. See, all this is coming out of here. And it ain't in there. I've got to receive it from another government. Yes. Yes, sir. Now, what did they say? Well, Pastor, really, now the problem is, really, is because is they don't want no black folks, you know. <laughs> that makes no difference with me. Amen. Amen. Now, Steve, can I, can I speak plain here to this group here? read in somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> Can I go back to the Bible, somebody? I read somewhere in the Bible that it says, if God be for me. Now, did I read that in the Bible? I read somewhere in the Bible it says, he always giveth me the victory. I, I read somewhere in the Bible it says, he always causes me to triumph. 
Now understand, I'm reading all of this. Now it's about time I act like some of this is true. So I didn't get huffy. I don't need to get mad at anybody. Why? Because I read Psalm chapter 82. I read that it says they walk on in darkness. They don't even know what they're doing. That's the enemy trying to keep me out. I wrestle not against flesh and blood. What is he trying to do? Keep me from ownership. Oh, yeah. The enemy is a negotiator, you know. He, he'll try to let you get saved, but leave your money. Folks, I got news for you. Redemption is not complete without divine provision. Everywhere you saw that if Abraham and went and rescued Lot, he got back the stuff. When David went and rescued the people that had run off with his, 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 his family, his, his kids and tribes and everything, he got them back and the stuff. I'm just saying, it, it's all right to get saved, but don't leave your stuff. All right, let's just keep going here. So my point to you is, they passed a law. But I went to prayer and downloaded God's strategy. Same into this. And I downloaded his strategy. And the next thing that happened, I said, okay, God told me, take a Bible. Don't use a King James, use the living. Now, this is God talking to me. This is what uh, uh, Brother Creflo and all talk about, talking about that grace, that he's moving us back to the garden. What did he do in the garden? He walked and talked with you. So I'm, I'm talking with God. He said, now take and take that. He said, now get your secretary to type it so you won't have to use your glasses and so forth. So he, he knows everything about you. Then he said, call a meeting and read it to the mayor. Now, right away, I could say, now, what is that going to do? You, you know what I mean? But I'm under command. That's all you've got to do. Whatever he said to you, do it. And so what happened? I did it just like he said it. Went in there, tried to talk. With get, get an appointment, he said, the mayor is tied up. I said, wait a minute. I said, I am a citizen of this village, and I demand to see the mayor. He said, oh, oh well, let, let me call you right back. Call me back. He said, hey, the mayor will see you for 15 minutes. I said, that's all I need. So I go in there. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know this. God's word won't return void. Amen. I'm talking about taking ownership now because the enemy doesn't want you to own it. Jesus didn't die for payments. He died for ownership. He, he didn't die so you can have a long 30 year. That's all right. Don't be condemned over that. But I'm telling you right now, you supposed to own it. That's right. Amen. And own it day one. Praise God. Now, so what? Are y'all all right now? Can I keep going? Amen. That's what I did. Got it out, pulled it out. See, I don't. You know, all this time, well, she might not like you and so forth. So what? So it's your cousin don't like you. You just don't know about it. Okay. So I go in there, start reading it. All of a sudden, phew, looked like the blood went out the mayor's face, jumped up, said, uh, Reverend, can you sit right here? Boom, went in there, checked somebody and so forth, came back. Reverend, I don't know what to do. They have passed a law. They have passed an ordinance, so forth and so forth. And I said, okay, can I call you in two hours? I said, yes, you can. Now, I've got to be in there tonight. I've got service tonight. I'm talking about God will deliver you speedily. Yeah. Let me say something. This is, I wrote this down because I, I feel that God is telling me to tell you this right now. 
I don't care what you've been going through. This is the last time you're going to go through that. shame that has taken place in your life, God is restoring you double. I declare in the name of Jesus that you are no longer permitted to stay in any affliction that the devil has got you in. Whatever's been harassing you after this meeting will harass you. Instead of the devil harassing you, you are about to harass the devil. Sit down. Now wait a minute. Are you going to receive that? How can they hear without a preacher? See, some of them came back and preached. Well, we can't take it. The giants are tall. The walls are great. So forth and so on. And... And then others came back and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Who in here is well able? Because I'm taking over the well able. Woo! I'm taking the well able. I need some able. Folks, we are about to see the greatest manifestation or demonstration of the agreement between heaven and earth that's been seen since the days Solomon built his temple. I'm here to tell you, we are about to see heaven coming to earth. Everything that's out of line is going to line up. to order it. See, it's been spoken. Anytime you've got a prophetic agenda like that, you can't stop it. The only thing you can do is ask for an exemption. You can't stop it. Nobody can stop that flood. I'm telling you, nobody can stop what I'm preaching to you right now. Anything that's making you uncomfortable is about to be removed. Nobody can stop it. I need some believers in a believer's convention. All right, let's keep going. Now, so what about this now? What about this? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 1. Now, we're talking about ownership. Because Adam didn't take it, I said Satan took it. He took it and built his kingdoms. The Bible says over in uh, Revelation chapter 11 that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God. Say amen to this. We have got a God that is backing us up. Say amen to this. And if I look, where did I tell you? Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 1. Look what it says now. This is for you. This is wherever he would send us. Don't think we just, Adam was some, just some weed puller. He, he, he was a ruler over this earth. 
And God is restoring. That's why I said Brother Copeland led right into my message. It's called Jubilee. It's called bringing things back into the hands of his rightful ownership. Look what it said in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Watch this. To root out to pull down, to destroy. Ooh, I like this next one. Throw down. To build, come on, and plant. Every law is going to have to come in line. And because we're going to take ownership mentality, we're not going to just let them take the Bibles out of the schools and just say how bad it is. Say amen, somebody. Now, as I'm looking at this, I begin to think about some things. And I think sometimes we kind of take an opportunity to lose some ground or by losing some hope and thinking that, hey, wait a minute, this thing happened, it shouldn't have happened, and so forth and so on. But remember that the people of the world are walking in darkness. Are you with me? And the Bible tells you in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to pray for kings. That pray for people that are in authority. Say amen to that. Amen. Well, what happened when I took ownership? We bought that mall. That's ours. You tell me I can't do something on my property. And so what happened is I went. And when I did that, God absolutely took over. Now what I shared with you day before yesterday is the fact that faith is something. Faith is something. Right over here. Bring me an amplifier. Well, give me a hand. There it is, right there. Uh, no, 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 no. So just come on. You, you had it in your hand before. No, 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 no. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, come on down. Come on down. Boy, they know the amplified, don't they? They know when they're calling for the amplified. Boy, they know there's something in that amplified. Amen. I'm just letting you know you can sit anywhere, but if you got the word, you can get rich. Oh, that's you. You are you here already. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Oh, he gave me something to give you. Uh, money cometh. All right. I said in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, this is key for you to see this. Hebrews chapter 11. He says in verse 1 of the Amplified. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. So faith is the assurance, the confirmation, and the title deed. Faith is also the proof. Say amen to that. Here's $100. May the Lord bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name. And somebody put me $100 back up here, so I'm going to just put that in my pocket. That's called the law of replenishment. That's right. That's how fast it happens. There's no more time. So as we look at this, I want you to see that once you have faith, you have the title. And it's 
see it as a courtroom and you've got to show proof that what you're wanting to possess belongs to you. And once you show God faith, God gets involved in evicting Satan out of your thing. That make any difference what it is. But you got to show him some faith. Say amen to that. Revelation is the strongest asset in the school of faith. When you see something, your faith locks in. Say amen to that. So the enemy tries to, of course, get us from seeing things. He tries to get us uh, not to meditate the word or so forth and so on and tried to make us believe that there's a shortage and there's no shortage of anything I got news for you your days of pulling up to the gas station talking about give me three on three that's over now I want you to see this I want you to see this. I want you to see this. That's all right, my brother. My brother, let me tell you something. Come in, come in, come in. Come in. Told me to go. Yeah, I understand. I understand. I understand. And I'm laying hands on you right now. There it is. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Now. Now, let's look at this. Let's look at this. If you go, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. Go with me over to Isaiah chapter 36. <laughs> I mean, Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33. That's all right. Let him lay down there. Isaiah chapter 33. All right. Look what it says. <laughs> look what it says. In Isaiah chapter 33, now here's what I'm saying. Now watch this. Because some laws may be made by the judicial systems of this country. But I'm letting you know, don't get all upset. Because we've got power to reverse laws. I'm talking about favor. Come on now. They made a law to keep Daniel from praying. In Daniel chapter 6. Am I right about it? And instead of Daniel just bowing down to that law. He went up in his room. Opened up the shutters. Begin to Hassan And notice they took him and put him in the lion's den. But what happened to him? Nothing. The lion wouldn't touch him. And I'm telling you, once you come into the kingdom, you are divinely protected. So what happened? <clears throat> the lion wouldn't bite him. Now the king got him out the next day and changed the laws. I said the king changed the laws. I said, how about Esther? 
Mordecai told Esther, said, girl, you got to go up there and intercede for the people. And Esther said, if I go up there unannounced or uncalled for, then I could get my head cut off. He said, Esther, let me tell you like this, girl. If you don't go, God will bring deliverance from some other place. Say amen to that. He promised you and I that many are the afflictions of the righteous. But God shall deliver them. Esther fasted for three days, got her courage together, put on her royal robe, that that robe again. She walked into the king's chamber, into the throne room, and the king pointed his scepter out and said this, Esther, whatever you want, up to half of my kingdom, say I'm a joint heir, up to half of my kingdom will I give you. What happened? She ended up changing the laws. I'm here to tell you that the God that we serve, if he'll change the law for Daniel and he'll change the laws for Esther, he'll change it for Bill Winston. Folks, don't get upset about the law that just been 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 the 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 what has just happened at the Supreme Court. Look at Isaiah chapter 33. And look if you will at verse 30, 22. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord, come on, is our lawgiver. The Lord, come on, is our king, and he will deliver us. Come on over to Psalm chapter 75. See, he said, my people are destroyed. Why? For lack of knowledge, not for lack of money, not for lack of education, for lack of spiritual knowledge. Look what he says in Psalm 75, and look at verse 6. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Keep going, come on. But who? God is the judge. He will do what? He'll put one down and lift up another. God is the judge. What makes him the judge? Because he decides who wins or loses. Not your opponent. The one thing we want to do is make sure we're on the Lord's side. So what am I saying? It's not too late. We can issue some commands. Boy, I sure hope I had a bunch of believers up in here. I'm, I'm telling you. All right. Let's keep going. What am I saying? When you go into a place, the kingdom of God is in you. And his kingdom rules over how much? Everything. Everything. Makes no difference what it is. They changed the laws. We went in the place. And we have since blessed that whole village. When, when the mortgage crisis hit, all the other, all the other villages laid off people. What did this village do? They didn't lay off anybody. Why? Because the tax, millions of dollars of tax money from retail sales that we get, that they get, they could afford to keep all their people. We were a blessing to them. Say amen to that. All right. Let's keep going. Let's go to 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. See, don't ever let the devil steal your hope. Amen. You know, he's he, he, he just a bully. 
I, I remember, where did I hear that story? This, this guy is in the schoolyard, and this bully was talking about all the people he can whip, you know, that he could beat up. And he had a list and had everybody's name on there. And this one guy saw his name on the list. And he came to the bully and said, listen, said, I, I, I heard, I saw that you had my name on that list and you can't whip me. The bully said this, well, I take it off. I think, I think sometimes if we'll just stand up to the bully, he'll take your name off the list. Praise God. All right, remember what I said now. God is not running the world. He's running the church. You're not waiting on God to do these things. God is waiting on you. And Jesse preached it last night. Believe the unbelievable or the impossible or something, what he said. Now, my point to you is, is, is stop putting limitations on what God can do through you. Because there are no more limits. Say amen to that. All right, let's whip this thing a little bit further. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. How am I doing on time there? Oh, okay. <laughs> she said, I got 10, 10 more minutes. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right. Look what it says in verse 21. All right, now I'm talking about ownership. Say ownership. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, verse 19, pardon me, the wind is blowing my paper. Verse 21, therefore let no man glory in men, for all things, come on, help me, are yours. Woo-wee! Now, what does this mean? All things are yours. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All things. All things. Now remember, there is no shortage. All right, let me give you this. What happened... Over in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 26, when this woman comes to pour some oil on Jesus, an alabaster box of oil. And one of the disciples got upset about it. He said, you could have saved that and we could have sold it and given it to the poor. Jesus said, well, the poor you'll have with you always, but me you'll not have. Now, here's, here's what I got out of that. Shortage. What you believe is what you become. And this is a part of seeing, because seeing is believing. That's why the devil tries to affect your, your spiritual sight, because it's believing. You're designed to believe what you see. Now, This woman poured this oil and God spoke to me and said, now, what about that? I said, well, they felt that that was it. That, that oil, they could have saved it, sold it, done something else with it, that apparently this wasn't the most important thing they could have done, so forth and so on. He said, but tell me about shortage. And I began to think about that. 
There is no shortage in the kingdom of God. There is no shortage. There, the idea of running out doesn't exist. There is an inexhaustible supply of everything you will ever need. Most of what's meant for this earth is not visible yet. And by faith, we have to access it and bring it into this physical realm. Amen. Amen. There's plenty. Say plenty. plenty. Let's look at what I'm talking about. I went back here in 1 Corinthians chapter 17. 17. This is when the prophet came to the woman and she only had one meal left. She had some, some oil in a jar, a little oil in a jar, and a little whatever that was, meal in a cruise or whatever. And she said, I'm going to bake this for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Am I right about it? What happened? He said, make me a cake first and bring it to me and then make for you and your son. For thus saith the Lord, the barrel of your meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She went and did what he said, and she and he and her son did eat many days. Every time he went back to the jar of oil, what was happening? It was more oil. More oil. Where did it come from? See, this, this is not something that's magic. This is something that's already put there. How about another one? Over in 2 Kings chapter 4. Notice what happened over there. Here was a woman who who Brother Copeland spoke about it yesterday or last night or whatever. And what had happened is her children were about to be taken, two sons, and put in bondage because the husband had died and left her in debt. The man of God said, what do you have in your house? She said, I don't have anything in the house save a pot of oil, a little jar of oil. He said, that's enough. Go borrow some vessels. Now, wait, 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 wait now. Don't borrow a few. Bring them back in here, shut the door with you and your sons and begin to pour. Amen. And she went and she did what the man of God said. I'm just letting you know, all you have to do is do what he said. This is the time we're in. We're out of time. You ain't got to figure it out. Just do it. Now, what happened? <clears throat> they all began to multiply. Now notice, there is no scarcity. Well, Pastor West, I, I heard you got a jet. Yep, and it's paid for. Now wait, wait, wait now. Why don't you get one? There ain't, there ain't no shortage, man. You don't need to be jealous because of my members. No, 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 Pastor, he's jealous because he, oh, you stealing his members. I'm what? You got three million people out here around your church unsaved and I'm sealing your members. You found what I'm saying? I'm saying it's amazing how this shortage mentality gets on us and we start thinking running out instead of running over. And it's time for you to think unlimited supply. Ooh. All right. Last place. In verse 21, therefore let no man glory in men for all things are yours. 
Whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas, the world of life or death of things present, things to come, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. All right, can I sh share with you one more thing? Yes, sir. This is why entrepreneurship is so important in a country. I, I wrote it, so let me, let me just read it. Through entrepreneurship, you tap into the creative capabilities to create something that would meet a need or a service. And in this environment, you might, it might be improving health, it might be improving a joy of life or whatever have you. But in entrepreneurship, People are not fighting over the same slice of pie. Say amen to this. They are creating a bigger pie. That's why entrepreneurship is so important. Now I kind of introduce that sometimes. People don't think that's very spiritual. Are you kidding me? That God put inside of people who are entrepreneurs creative ability. Yeah, yeah. And, and they're going to create a larger piece of pie. That's why you've got all these, all, look at Washington. They're trying to fight for the same piece of pie. Well, I, I want this and that and, and pork belly and this, whatever it is. Instead of creating a bigger piece of pie. For it is written, ah, oh man, this page keeps moving. Therefore, let no man glory in men for all things are yours. Whether well, Paul or Paulus or Cephas. All right, let me explain that to you. Say, all things are mine. All things are mine. Now, that doesn't mean, like I said, you go out and my name is Jimmy, I'll take all you give me. That's, that, that doesn't, that, that it does not mean that. Okay? All right, now watch this. One day I was going to do a funeral, a going home service in Chicago, and I was on the south side, so I had to journey a bit to get over there to the south side. And once I got there, I was too early, about an hour too early, because I'd been given the wrong time or something. And then I said, okay, uh, is there a place I can get a cup of tea here? I, li I like hot tea. And they said, yeah, it's uh, McDonald's about two blocks down. I said, they said, uh, Dr. Winston, we'll take you down there. I said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. I said, I'll just walk a beautiful spring day. I'll just walk down there. So. I'm walking down to this McDonald's. I get to the McDonald's parking lot, and I'm crossing the parking lot, and I hear this voice ring out from inside of a car. There's the man of God. So, <laughs> Lord, have mercy. So I got into McDonald's. There's some people in there, so I got in line to get my cup of tea. And this door swung open. <laughs> There's a man of God. This real heavyset lady with a cane and she could hardly walk. I knew it was my day. I got up this morning and something said, this is your day. I knew, I knew there is the, the man of God. I mean, she's just carrying on. Everybody looking at, looking at me. And so forth. I said, I know what this lady wants. She wants me to lay hands on her. I'm going to lay hands on her too. <laughs> so she got close enough and I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. The cane went up in the air. The lady went back like that. And she said, I told you it was my day. I told you. Whoa. She knew something. Yes. She took ownership yes. over the anointing yes. that was on my life. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes. The anointing that is on these men of God's life that are teaching you this week, That's right. take ownership. 
That anointing is there to prosper you. It's there to serve you. She didn't back off. Think about it. Same one with the woman with the issue of blood. What did she do? She came up behind Jesus, didn't she? She said, if I can just touch his clothes, I'm going to be whole. Now here's this woman, not, not supposed to, by the law, she's not supposed to be at the house. Here she come down the house, touched his gum, whoo, virtue flow, totally healed. He didn't even know she was back there. Except he felt virtue going out of it. He didn't give her permission. Just draw from where you are. I said, just draw from where you are. You come in that meeting, I tell you, I've been preaching before, and I in, in, in our church, and I'd go over one side, I'd preach, and I'd come back, and I'd say, man, and I'd even apologize at the end. I'd say, hey, listen, y'all, I, I don't know what the Lord was doing. I was going, I, if it seemed a little confusing, I'd say, just blame the Lord. I mean, I, I just, don't, don't look at me. I, I just was going where I felt led. A lady would come up to me after I'm shaking hands. She said, Pastor, I was fasting three days, and this is the fourth day. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm going to this church house. And I'm going to get this answer to my problem that I need today. She said, Pastor, you gave them to me. One, two, three, four. Just like that. Now, what am I saying to you? She took ownership over that. Paul, Apollos, and Cephas. I'm in Africa preaching. Brother and Sister Copeland was out there. And Brother Copeland was up there in front of, well, that, it was about 400,000 people. And, and he was preaching at that time, and he said something. God, y'all know how Brother Colton talked. God <clears throat> has made you rich beyond your wildest imagination. Boy, when he said that, I almost wanted to get up and run around that place. I took that word, began to meditate it. And that word is doing things for me and my ministry. See, all you need is the word. Paul, Apollos, or Cephas, or the world. The world is yours. I said the world is yours. If you don't like something in it, change it. You are a change agent for Jesus Christ. Say amen to that. Then he says this, watch this. He says, um, <laughs> tell you, Paul Apollos is either the world or life or death. Now, here's life. You don't have to look old to be old. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Don't run out on me now. Don't run out on me. <laughs> Over in Genesis chapter 47 and verse 8, Pharaoh asked Jacob one question How old are you? And Jacob, I believe, was embarrassed. Why? Because he was only 130. And he said, my daddy left here at 180. My granddaddy left here at 175. And I just began to look at that. I began to look at even 2 Kings chapter 5, where a man named Naaman, went and dipped in a river. And the Bible says when he came up, his flesh was like a newborn baby. I really believe you can turn back the hands of time. Listen, don't argue with me. Just believe the impossible. Praise God. Life or death or death. What does it mean, or death? No longer can the grim reaper come into your room one night and snatch your life out. 
Those days are over. No longer are you going to fear death. You done done all the dying you ever going to do. Now, if you remember Moses' life and what happened with Moses, Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 34, it says that Moses' eyes were not dim, neither his natural forces abated. You all remember that? Then it says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, God said, Moses, now I'm, you're finished with your ministry, go on up there and die. And I tell people, what was the condition of Moses when God told him that? His eye was not dim. Come on. It is natural force of baby. You don't have to be sick to die. And what am I saying about you? I'm saying that all things are yours. Now here's the, here's the bottom line. When you inherit the world, I'm going to put it in my own words. You get the good and the bad. You're responsible for the saving of every soul. Everywhere he sends you, he expects you to transform it. You're not God's representative of a supply. You're representing him with a supply. You are a walking supply house. That is why he, Jesus laid hands on the man when he took him out of the town and he asked him, what do you see? He said, I see men as trees. Some people think he didn't heal him at that time because he laid hands on him again after that. Now he did heal him, but he was restoring his headship first. That man, a tree produces, he provides things for other people. And I'm saying everywhere he sends you and I, he is sending us there to lift a curse off of that place. So the drug problem is not the world's problem. It's our problem. Come on now. The literary problem, the literacy problem is not the world's problem. That's our problem. Come on. All of this, the church. And we're going to have enough resources to lift the curse off of every life we come across. A week. When we preach about wealth transfer, it's not just so you can sit on it. It's so that you can use it to alleviate suffering over this entire planet. Now I'm saying this to you today. Take ownership. This planet does not belong to the devil and his bunch. Can I show you one more verse? Yes. Come on over with me to Genesis chapter 28, please. Genesis chapter 28. Are y'all getting something out of this? I, I can't, I don't feel the same flow the other, the other day, but, but, but I, I believe somebody's getting something out of this. Now, have you got, what have you got? Genesis chapter 28? Yeah. All right, let me just show you this. In Genesis chapter 28, remember what we said now. This is a jubilee. This is God taking and putting the resources of this earth back into the hands of its rightful ownership. Look what he says here in Genesis chapter 28. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise and go to Pandarum to the house of Bethel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence and of the, of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty do what to you? Bless you and make you fruitful and what else? And multiply you, at, that thou mayest be a multitude of people and give thee the blessing of who? Abraham. Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest what? Inherit the land wherein 
thou art a stranger, glory to God, which God gave unto Abraham. Notice what he said. He's going to put a blessing on you. Watch this. I'm going to put it in my words so that you can inherit everything strangers have. Amen. I'm talking about ownership now. Now, like I said, you don't go out there, stick nobody up, give me that stuff. You know, that, that's not the way this happens. But like Brother Copeland says, it's a blessing to people. But I have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. When we were going to buy a car for somebody one time, they were in need of a car. And God spoke to my heart and said, I want you to buy it. Now, understand what he said. You belong to Christ. Say, I belong to Christ. Belong. Remember now, he's the chief and the commander. He's the general. He gives the orders. To buy the car. So what did we do? We went out to do it. Now, we looked at these cars, very nice, and so forth. The man saw me and knew me. He said, hey, uh, if you come back on Saturday, you can get a better deal. They have an auction. I said, hey, that sounds good. So we went, came back on Saturday. Once we came back, we were there looking at this nice um, Toyota. It was a used Toyota late model. And we we're going to just buy it, so forth. And uh, the guy came and said, well, what do you think? I said, yeah, this looks like the one. I said, well, praise God. He said, uh, <clears throat> let me call the general manager because you're going to make a deal with him. He called him. General manager came over. He said, yeah, what can I help you? He, he introduced us. He said, what can I help you with? I said, well, we're looking at this car here. He said, uh, <clears throat> what do you give me for it? Just like that. So he said, let's see, on the window it says 10500 Okay, what do you give me for? I said, all right. So I stepped back. Now I'm, I'm listening for God. God said, give him 2200 <laughs> Now wait a minute. I'm not trying to cheat anybody. I'm going to follow the Holy Ghost. Because he's going to lead me to the land that belongs to me. He led me to that mall. He led me to that airplane. He led me to that car. Because I'm under authority. They give him $2,200. I said, huh? He said, give him $2,200. I stepped forward. By the time I placed my next foot, my courage had dropped. I said, I'll give you 3000 He I was listening at y'all. Ah, uh, you wait. Okay, just for that, you're gonna have an opportunity. You, God's gonna bring you an opportunity. He's gonna bring you an op. You will get an opportunity in the next week. See, you shouldn't have said it. And and what happened? Why well, said watch this? He looked at me, looked at my wife, looked at the other salesman, looked up up in the sky, and he looked at me and said, "I'll take it." I said, oh, Lord Jesus, man. How about this? Jesus said, listen, go in town, you two disciples, you're going to see a donkey tied up. Here's what I want you to do. Unloose him and bring him to me. And if anybody asks you, why are you taking unloosing that donkey? Tell him the Lord has need of it. And he will let him go. There was this man. He was a monk. This true story. And he got struck in the head with lightning. He was out in a garden up, up at a monastery. And it was thundering and lightning. He got hit in the head with lightning. Head split open died instantly. He went to the feet of Jesus and Jesus said, I'm not done with you yet. I'm going to put you back together and I want you to do such and such and such for me. And oh, by the way, go to such and such a Cadillac dealership and tell him I said to give you a car. Now, thank God he didn't send him to a Schwinn bicycle dealer. <laughs> Okay. Okay. You know, he pushed himself out of that slab. This is a true story. And he went, got some clothes, went to the dealership, got there, asked the man, 
He said, is Mr. So-and-so here, the owner? He said, no, he's out to lunch right now. Can I help you? He said, well, I want to see him about a car. He said, oh, well, I can help you with that. And so he said, no, I'm supposed to see him. He said, I understand that, but I can take care of you. And by the time he gets here, we can have this thing all tied up and so forth. He said, no, sir. I appreciate it, but I'm supposed to see him. So he said, all right, fine. Sit in his office, right outside his office here, and just wait. He'll be back in a few minutes. The man came back. Well, when he was outside, the other man said, hey, you got a hot one in there. I mean, he, he's ready to buy a car, so forth. So the owner came in. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Come on in the office here and sit down. What can we put you in? He said, the Lord told me to come here that you were going to give me a car. The owner looked at him. Tears started rolling down the owner's face. He took his head, put it in his hand, said, the Lord came to me in a dream and told me you were going to come. And, and he pulled out the drawer. Here are the keys of the blue Cadillac out there at the end of the lot. This one I saw myself. This gentleman was a pastor. I flew out there to see it myself. He said, you got to come see this house. I said, how did you get it? He said, I got a call late at night one night, and the man said to me, are you uh, Reverend so-and-so? I said, yes. He said, something told me to give you my house. He said, okay, he thought it was a crank call, hung the phone up and went back to bed. <laughs> Two weeks later, a phone call came again from the same person panicking. Listen, you come see this house. Thump, thump. I'm out here in Vegas and something said, get up and give that man that house. He said, you got to see this house. The guy got the address and everything. So that Sunday afternoon after church service and so forth, he went out there. This is California. He pulled up at the gates. The house was 150 yards from the gate. And he said, uh, <clears throat> buzz the thing. The guy said, oh, I'm glad you're here. Come on in. So he came, drove up to the house. The guy had double doors behind him, and the doors were open. And inside, behind the guy, he said he saw a waterfall. Water was falling over an onyx stone. Now, a lot of God's people don't even know what onyx stone is, but he was falling over onyx stone. And uh, he showed him all around. The, the coach house was a three-bedroom house uh, and so forth. He said, uh, something told me to, to give you this house. He said, now you're supposed to give me your house. Now the preacher had a house with a mortgage on it worth about $250,000. Uh, he gave the man that house. The man gave him his house. The house was appraised at seven and a half million. And he gave him the house. Now, oh, hold on, wait, why am I telling you this? Not so you can go out, wake up in the morning and talk about, well, I believe the Lord is sending me down to that Cadillac dealership <laughs> at Mercedes dealership down there on the corner. No, the Lord has need of it. See, all things are yours. And this is the fact that God is going to use you to expand his kingdom. And he's going to transfer into your hands whatever's needed, whatever could, it is, is, is involved in making your life better, and transfer it into your hands so that you can finish his work. Amen. Say amen to that. Amen. So I'd just like to read one thing that Brother Copeland said, and this is what I wrote down because I think it's so very important. He said this. He said, we are not stewards. We are owners with stewardship responsibilities. I think that is so profound. But from now on, I'm going to tell you right now, you are an owner. Amen. Watch this. Nothing's supposed to go on in this earth without your permission. Amen. If it's not right, fix it. Amen. That's from 
from conditions and neighborhoods to laws. Stop seeing shortage because there is none. If he can't stack it up for you, he'll work the law of replenishment. As fast as you give it, he'll give you more. Say amen to that. And I'm telling you now, whatever's been harassing you, I'm declaring today will harass you no longer. Whatever's been stolen from you, from this meeting on, is now coming back home. Whatever's been making you uncomfortable, I got good news for you. The comforter is coming to remove it. Some of you have been, 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 been under a sickness or under something. We're about to see the greatest outpouring of the Spirit of God. I'm talking about in a time that nobody needs to lay hands on you. All you do is come to the meeting. And the glory of God will fall in that place. Now this is your day, this is your hour, this is your time. I'm your prophet right now. I prophesy to you that your life will never be the same after this meeting. I prophesy to you that the grace of God is going to work in your life like never before. Come on, whatever affliction you've got, I speak healing to it right now. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, the devil has been stealing, but he's not going to steal any longer. Come on, I'm talking about debt cancellation. God is about to lead you to a piece of property you can't afford. Now, just do what the Spirit of God said do. My wife and I, the first house, we came back. We looked at houses for three days and came back. And the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, ask her which one of those does she like? I said, baby, God told me to ask you which one do you like? She said, you mean which one can we afford? I said, he didn't tell me to ask you that. He told me to ask you which one did you like? Remember what Jesse said. You don't have to pay for it. You have to believe for it. And notice what happened. I said, she said, well, I like that big one up on the hill with that circular driveway. I said, let's get down and pray. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to get the strategy now. I said, I'm trying to get the strategy. I just want to hear from headquarters. Now I'm open to the kingdom uh, communication. Glory to God. So we got down to pray. As soon as we got down there, God said, get up and get your wife. Go over there to that community and point at that house and command it to sell to you. Yeah. What did we do? I said, baby, God said, get up, go over there, point at that house and command it to sell to us. She said, well, let's go. Now we had to go over there to that neighborhood. Now that neighborhood was a very, very neighborhood that folks kind of looked like me. Don't go in there too late at night because so forth and so on. But that don't make no difference. I'm a joy to air. I'm a joy to air. Now, we have been meditating the scripture in Deuteronomy. It just says, I've given you cities that you didn't build and houses full of all good things that you didn't fill. Somebody tried to get on me. Well, how about a car? I said, the car is in the garage. <laughs> we pointed, we got over there. In the name of Jesus, I command you house, house, I'm talking to you. I command you sell to me now. And what happened is things start happening. My boss called me at work. He said, hey, Bill, we got a contest for managers. I said, okay, what is it? He said, well, it's eight to $10,000. I said, oh, okay. He said, I got news for you. You won. And so forth. That's how things, come on now. We put into operation spiritual forces. I said, all things are yours. 
I said all things are yours, visible and invisible. They belong to you. Now say this with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, from this day forward, I have heard your word. Yes, I have stewardship responsibilities, but I am an owner. And from this day, I have an ownership mentality. No longer will I allow Satan to steal because he cannot steal what I cover by faith. This day is a new day in my life. I take ownership over this whole earth to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Wherever my feet shall tread, you have given to me. I receive it now. I don't doubt it. I believe I'm an owner.